<clears throat> this morning we are turning to the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall stream to it. Many people will come and say, Let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us the ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word from the Lord of Jerusalem. He will judge the nation between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of, Ju of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are you ready yet? Yes. <laughs> Anyone with kids has said those words on a Sunday morning. There's always that one creative soul who's the last one to get ready. And when, I, when my daughters were young, of course, I would ask that question on a Sunday morning. And yeah, it was Madeline who would come down looking in a totally unique clothing combination, right? I'm not sure why it takes longer to get dressed on Sunday. Monday through Friday, we get ready for school. Okay, maybe Ann was a little slow on that. But school days have a routine. And Saturday, of course, they'd be up early to watch cartoons or play games. But when I was young, when a lot of us were young, getting ready for church was considered a special obligation. I had one or maybe two Sunday dresses. I had Sunday shoes, I had Sunday socks, I had gloves and a hat and of course that little purse with a chain. And that's not a picture of my family, but that little girl could have been me, you know, real snarky like right that. You know, at that time it was important that we would get dressed up for church. We used to think that we were putting on our best self for God. And when I think about that now, I think it's kind of bizarre. Because God surely knew that those Mary Jane Patton leathers were not my best self. But today we're more flexible, right? I think that's just fine. We're more authentic with our true selves. If you want to wear something that's more upscale, then that's just fine. And if you want to wear shorts, as long as you're covered, that's fine too. I'd much rather you come to church and be comfortable than to not come to church at all. I think what matters more is that what we're bringing in our hearts. So are we spiritually prepared to come to church? And even more important, do we, even if we're not spiritually prepared to come in, do we come with an expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to convict us and work through us and renew us so that when we leave this place, without a doubt, we'll know we've been revived. But the topic today is Advent, Pastor Pam. Okay, Advent from the Latin, venio, which means to come, and ad, which means the next, to come next. We're doing a lot to get ready for Christmas now. Since we passed the corner of Thanksgiving, Christmas decorations are now legal. The churches are all adorned with trees, the garland. Of course, I'm going to miss the lights on my front bushes this year because I don't have any front bushes this year. But I'm adding some angels, and provided that the wind will die down a little bit and the rain will stop, I'm hoping to get them out this afternoon. The industrious among us have even purchased or made some of their gifts. We have parties and celebrations and, of course, 
Christmas cookies. But preparing for Christmas really should be a, a spiritual matter. Just like getting ourselves ready for church, these wonderful weeks give us time to prepare for the magnitude of the coming of Christ. I think, though, that we need to remember that Advent was always not about getting ready for Christmas. And another fun fact for you, in the 4th century, Advent was a season of preparation, but it was preparation for baptism that would occur on Epiphany, the Feast of the, of the Magi, when we celebrate the wise men coming to visit baby Jesus. During that time, the people who would be baptized would spend 40 days in penance and prayer and fasting to get ready for their baptism celebration. And originally there was no connection between, between the beginning of that period of 40 days and Christmas. But by the 6th century, the Roman Christians, you got to love the Romans, they tied Advent to the coming of Christ. But in their view, it was not the coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ in, in the manger. It was instead the second coming in the clouds as the judge of the world. I skipped that baptism slide, sorry. It wasn't until the Middle Ages that Advent became explicitly linked to Christmas and Christ's first coming. So today we see these four weeks before Christmas as a time we spiritually prepare to celebrate Messiah's coming, to get ready to receive Jesus into our hearts. Isaiah, the prophet, was getting ready for the Messiah 800 years before Christ's arrival. And this wonderful text today gives us a few clues as to what we can do to renew our anticipation. And when we look at Isaiah's prophecy, these words really are both a future telling and a truth telling. Now in some ways, this prophecy was fulfilled in the first advent of the Messiah. Now, on the other hand, the complete fulfillment of God's promises will not come to pass until the second advent. So we're living in between that already and not yet. Be before, uh, between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And no matter where we are on that span of time, we know God keeps his promises. So our Advent preparation is first believing in God's promises. The coming of the Messiah at Bethlehem fulfilled God's promise of salvation. And God has promised us to a world where love reigns. The promise of the past was fulfilled and so we can believe and trust in God's promise for the last days. But that's also going to occur according to his word. We believe God's promises. Advent also reminds us that God's promises and priorities are given for everyone. In Isaiah's lifetime, worship of Jehovah and the study of the scrolls was reserved for the Jewish people. But God makes it clear in this prophecy the plan for the world included all nations. When the temple is established, it will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. The gospel is universal. When Jesus was born, the angel came and said to the shepherds, I bring you good news, which will be great joy for all people. The angel did not say just for the chosen subscribers. The angel didn't say just for those people who do right all the time. Or just for those people with brown hair and brown eyes. No, the angel said all people. God's priority is to love every human being. Now is that our priority? Are we satisfied that the good news is just for us? Are we caught up in the 
holiday trappings and the busyness of the Christmas season, so God's missionary purpose is no longer a priority. When we're more concerned about what's going under the tree than what is in our heart, then we are not ready for Christmas. We're not sharing God's priorities. Finally, both Isaiah and Micah prophesied at the time when the nations would reshape their implements, and Gary read this this morning, implements in, of, of war into implements of peace. Although Micah is actually quoting Isaiah, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This inscription is on the front of the United Nations building in Washington, or in uh, New York, the headquarters building. It was engraved on the building in 1948 when it was constructed, but the attribution to Isaiah, you see in, in this earlier picture, it wasn't there. It was added in 1975. And this wall faces the plaza. It's been the site of a lot of peace protests. The meaning of the prophets here in the word nations is that the nations will be at peace with each other when the nations are at peace with God. We, too, as people will be at peace with each other when we are at peace with God. And that peace, that spark of the beginning of that peace began when Jesus was born. The angel announced, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those on whom his favor rests. Us. I wonder what world peace would look like. I recall a storyline of a television show that allowed the hero to have three wishes. And the first wish he made was the altruistic wish for world peace. And when the genie granted the wish, all the other people in the world disappeared. I think if there were only one person in the world, there still would not be peace. Because if it were me left, I'd be debating with myself. But the world is a long way from peace among nations and peace among people. But didn't just a month ago we read in Matthew 24 where Jesus also said that until the end there would be wars and rumors of wars. Global peace is not here, and the end is not here. But those who know Jesus personally know his peace. Jesus personifies God's peace through his teaching, through his actions, through his salvation. We understand what person-to-person -person peace looks like. So we can rely on these words from Isaiah to give us the grounding we need to prepare ourselves in this Advent to walk in the light of Christ. Believe in God's promises. Share God's priorities and personify God's peace in Jesus. It's time for us to get ready. It's time for us to get our hearts ready. Amen.